Knight, and I lead environmental sustainability for Google TV, where we are working to create a more sustainable TV product for our users and the environment. Today, I am both delighted and honored to be joined by a six-time grantee of the National Geographic Expeditions Council to discuss his work on the Hudson River Stories Project, which explores climate change and other environmental challenges for the Hudson River Valley, the birthplace of the American environmental movement. As one of society's ocean heroes, his first assignment for National Geographic magazine was documenting a 3,741 mile crossing of Antarctica by dog sled. He has written 11 books and produced and directed more than 30 documentary films. His National Geographic sponsored Oceans 8 project took him and his teams around the world by sea, by sea kayak over the course of 10 years. And for the past several years, he and his team have focused on a series of short films called the Hudson River Stories, which dives into the risks to and hopes for the Hudson River Valley. John Bowermaster, welcome to Talks at Google. Thanks you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yeah, it's great to be here uh, in the Hudson Valley. I, I don't know how many of your listeners, viewers are, are within uh, driving distance, but probably probably a lot. Um, That's right. Quite a few out here in the New York office. So, yeah. yeah I'm about 90 miles north of the city. I, I left Brooklyn in 1988 because I prefer to wake up surrounded by green rather than by cement. But <laughs> I share uh, that. great uh, proximity to, to New York City. Yeah, it's really nice to be close to the city, but also be able to enjoy all that New York has to offer upstate. Um, I'm up here in Chappaqua, so not too far from you. Cool. Well, thanks for that lovely introduction as well. I I, I wanted to, uh, you know, the focus I think today is going to be on the Hudson River, but I wanted to give you a little context of how I got to that point, um, which means going back through some of that National Geographic work, which is quite fun and beautiful and I'll, 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 I'll do it kind of quickly, but uh, we'll, get, we'll get to the Hudson River. There's a couple of video clips in here that are, that are fun. Um, you know, I've been doing this for, I hate to admit it, for quite a while. <laughs> and uh, so I've accumulated lots and lots of beautiful uh, assets, photos and videos and stories, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm kind of lucky because I knew from early on, maybe as a young teenager, what I wanted to do, which is to write. And you, you highlighted, I, I started as a print journalist. I've written for probably every magazine you can think of, as well as this, this 11 books. Um, but kind of at National Geographic's encouragement, I transitioned from focusing only on print and into uh, film. The National Geographic Society, you know, is, is a sizable content uh, uh, needer. You know, they, they publish magazines and books and TV shows and movies and and the mission, which is education, and then and the the, the uh, uh, videos, and of course now they have a big online presence. So they they have, they're, they have a hungry desire for for stories, which I was able to do because I could actually write. Oftentimes they run into situations where they fund expeditions or fund explorers, but uh, those persons aren't necessarily writers. So then they have to find somebody else to help them tell their stories. So with me, they kind of got good back to their bucks because I could tell the stories. And then I just took the same kind of repertorial skills and uh, turned them into making films, which has been great. That's amazing. Um, I have so many questions about your journey and the things that you've discovered. I know you've got a wonderful series of, of uh, slides and film for us to see here. So uh, let me let you take it away from there and take your time. And then once we come back, I have a whole bunch of questions. I'm excited to talk to you yeah, about. Yeah, well, I've, hopefully the pictures will encourage even more questions, but it's, an, it's a nice trip around the world. I'm looking forward to it. So thanks for the reminder and thanks for the opportunity. And I'll hit play and we'll see where we go. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of the work is uh, water related. As the introduction said, I, I, for I one, of ocean, or one, one of National Geographic's ocean heroes, and I'm the only one who doesn't really work with fish because uh, my real interest, and you'll see this through the through the imagery, is is in people. I need I need stories, so I need I need people. But the, my National Geographic experience started uh, in Antarctica uh, in 1988, 1989. I was assigned to write about this 3,741 mile uh, expedition across Antarctica by dog sled. It was the last expedition by dog sled. This picture is kind of classic. Uh, this is a trip that took seven months and this is what lunch looked like on a daily basis. Um, quite cold, quite, you know, 
Antarctica is, is summer in Antarctica only lasts a couple of months. So that means that most of the trip was done in the, in the winter, beginning in the winter and ending in the winter. Uh, dogs were forbidden from coming to Antarctica after this trip. So it was the last expedition by dog sled. Um, and, you know, we could talk about that later about why that is. Um, part of it's scientific. They, they were afraid that the dogs would bring disease to Antarctica. Uh, part of it's politi- political because they, you know, there is no 911. There's no police force. Uh, there's no rest. There's no military in Antarctica. So if you get in trouble down there, you, 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 you're, you're on your own. And the science bases, I think, get tired of the very occasional and rare uh, call from explorers needing to be bailed out. So they just started sh- clamping down on, on who could come to Antarctica. That said, uh, while this was in 1989, 1990, it was at a time that the Antarctic Treaty was being renegoti- renegotiated. Antarctica is the only place on the, on the, con- on the planet that is successfully uh, governed by international treaty. And so far, so good. It's still working. But interestingly, and, and maybe some of you have, have done it, uh, about 50 to 60,000 persons a year now visit Antarctica on, on cruise boats and tourist boats. So uh, it's not completely off limits, but largely off limits. But that, that big dog sled got me quite turned on by Antarctica. I'd, I'd not been before then. And so I kept going back uh, almost on an annual basis for many years, uh, doing smaller trips, one person, two person trips, climbing, skiing, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, through all of this, I kind of learned or, or, or caught on that a really great way for me to tell my the stories I was passionate about and particularly environmental stories was to use adventure, you know, to use pictures like these to draw people's curiosity into the place and, and then talk to them about the environmental concerns. This is Mount Vincent. This is the tallest mountain in Antarctica. You know, when people go and they climb the, the highest peak on each continent, the so-called seven summits, this is what they climb. Uh, it's not super t- tall. It's about 17,000 feet, you know, as compared to Everest, which is up near 29,000. But it's middle of Antarctica. It's super cold. So you want to go up and down as fast as you can. Uh, but that that Antarctica experience that inspired me, and I, I, I started getting all sorts of opportunities to travel and to write. So I, for, you know, a good 20 years, I, I led a pretty pretty good life of traveling and coming up with wild ideas, mostly about remote remote corners in the world and environmental stories. And it afforded me the opportunity to really kind of see the world from a, a really unique uh, perspective. This is a waterfall in the, in the big uh, national park at the southern tip of Chile. Uh, always interested in, in boating stuff. You know, the Grand Canyon is a mile deep. This is the Colca Canyon in Peru, two miles deep. It had only been rafted and kayaked one time before. We were the second group to go down it. Um, very technical, very fun, very, very adventurous. Um, this was in China. Uh, this was a story for National Geographic Magazine in which we uh, tried to, to run a, a tributary of the Yangtze called the Shuilohe. And it was extremely technical and tricky. You know, we, we, We'd make it one kilometer down the river and then have to cross to the other side and rig everything by, by ropes and, 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 and carabiners, et cetera, and cross things over to the other side. Big, big adventure, big adventure. And this was in the early 90s, probably 95, 96. Uh, I have a great introduction to Africa. You know, Peter Beard was a kind of photographer, raconteur, born in the, in the United States, in New York, but had lived in in, New York, in Africa for many years. And I wrote a book uh, called The Adventures and Misadventures of Peter Beard in Africa, which, again, was my introduction to big, big wildlife, big game, uh, the relationship between uh, beauty and wildlife, which was Peter's expertise. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, my real focus is on uh, the people we met. Uh, because again, fish are great, and I'm glad that there are scientists out there with passion for them, but fish can't tell me stories, whereas the people we met were full of stories. This is Brady Watson. He was the head of the forestry department in Nicaragua. He's a very sweet man in Vietnam offering up his last uh, watermelon. Uh, this was a miner in, in the desert of Bolivia. Fisherman, I love this picture of this French Polynesian fisherman. He just caught this big mahi mahi, and the skin, the color of it. See how it's green in the bottom and white at the top. The color was disappearing as almost as quickly as he pulled it out of the water. 
This is his mother waiting for dinner, I think, waiting for the fish. This is a, a salt a collector in the middle of the big cellar de uni in uh, southern Bolivia. You can see his bicycle in the background. He rides his bike out onto the big cellar every day and, and rakes salt, which uh, he sells. This is a performance artist in uh, off of the coast of Croatia, one of the islands of Croatia. She, she was replicating her vision of Shakespeare's Ophelia. You know, remember Ophelia drowns? Well, she, she argued my Ophelia doesn't drown. That's why she has that big red buoy with her. Um, a couple of fishermen also in Croatia. Uh, the wives of a couple of chiefs in, in Gabon in West Africa. And the cold, high desert of, of Argentina. Very desolate, very, very remote. And all these stories were done for, well, wide variety of magazines, but a lot of it for National Geographic. But then because of my water interest, uh, we kept looking for ways to explore by water. And, I, and you know, kind of, I'd always had kayaks, but I never really thought of them as expedition uh, craft. And so we started moving around, the, literally around the world by, by sea kayak. And the beauty of that was that we'd arrive in people's, uh, you know, beach sides uh, by kayak, not by motorboat, not by plane, not by car. And we were pretty easily accepted by the boating community, the, the seabaring, seafaring community. And I convinced National Geographic to, you know, it took a little bit of uh, time, but I convinced them over to, over the course of a couple of years to fund a 10 year long project where each year we would come up or I would come up with a, a, a representative coastline or place on each continent. And then we would go explore it and bring back stories of adventure, but also environment. Uh, the first was in the Aleutian Islands. That's a six thousand foot uh, six thousand foot volcano in the background in the Aleutians, and a and a twenty two foot long kayak in the foreground there. And this was I, I love this picture. This is pre drone, so I meant the photographer had to climb up a, a volcano on the other side of the channel and, and to get that picture. Uh, super cold water, thirty six degrees. So you you want to be very careful. You do not want to end up out of the boat. Uh, but it attracted a lot of attention to this story because of this unique combo of climbing volcanoes and kayaking among them. Uh, the Aleutian Island trip was, uh, we didn't see anyone. It was super cold. Uh, paddling days were short because of that cold water. So the next place we went was Vietnam, where we had long days on the water and met lots of people, and it was super hot. Um, you know, one-third of Vietnam's population lives on the coast, so it gave us access to lots of stories. And we went to the north of Vietnam specifically because I was curious 25 plus years after the end of fighting what North Vietnam was like, what we regard as North Vietnam was like. Uh, after Vietnam, Polynesia, we went to the remote uh, coral reef atolls of the Tuamotus and, you know, looked at what life was going to be out, what life was going to be like out here in these remote places where people live just, you know, a couple feet, a few feet above sea level. Um, again, great adventure, warm water again, which was, which was nice. Um, I do a lot of things. I make the films. I do the writing. I, I don't take the photographs. I was really, that was one of the luxuries of traveling with National Geographic is I always got to travel with really great photographers. Uh, this is by my friend, Pete McBride, uh, who I think on Instagram is at Pedro McBride. He, you should check him out if you, if you don't know him. Um, uh, I, I had great support from the outdoor industry, from, Mountain Hardware and Patagonia and, and here Perception Kayaks, uh, which you know the, I liked working with the big kayak companies because they didn't hesitate in sending my boats around the world uh, uh, as part of our agreement. I tried to talk them into using this. I tried to talk Perception into using this as a promo piece, but they didn't see the value in promoting uh, 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 sharks surrounding your kayak. Uh, did a little bit of sailing in Polynesia, which was fun. And this guy, I've seen. I've been back to Polynesia many times. I see this guy. He's a, uh, a a school boat driver, so he shuttles kids from little Motu to Motu, uh, completely covered in tattoos, uh, completely everywhere but his tongue, everywhere but his tongue. And he said they told the story of his entire family going back uh, many centuries. Um, a lot of beauty out there in the world. Clearly, this is in the uh, island of off the island of Fakarava in the two Motus. And we did kind of a weird one. We, you know, I, I'm being, I'm challenged, or I'm challenging myself every year, trying to find a unique place to go. And here we we went to the, the logical place to take kayaks, which is in South America, the driest place on Earth, uh, the high plains of the Altiplano Plano in southern Bolivia, northern Chile, northern Argentina. We dragged the kayaks around on these big bulbous tires, looking for water. 
which we found. And the relevance was that this blue lake there, this literally called Lago Verde, um, used to be is salty. That's not a giant mar margarita. That's salt on the rim. And where did all that salt come from? And part of it came from minerals in the ground and also from when the ocean used to be here uh, many, many millions of years before. And it gave me the opportunity to talk about how the planet changes and evolves and what are the driest places on Earth today haven't always been that way. Uh, this was kayaking at 15,000 feet, I think, super cold also. So we, we have a combination of warm waters and back to these cold waters. Uh, Gabon on the western uh, equator of, of Africa. Uh, this is my friend Mike Fay in the picture. Mike had walked across the Congo. Uh, it took him a year and a half documenting you know, every kind of living thing. He, his work, which appeared in National Geographic, convinced the president of, of Gabon at that time, a fellow named Bongo Bongo, uh, to declare uh, more like 12 to 13 percent of his country as national park in, in a place that had had, had that had had no national parks. So Mike became a huge hero for in the conservation world. This is a night where we, you know, traveling on the equator is great because you know when the sun's going to come up, you know when it's going to go down. And here we just ran out of light and there was nowhere to, nowhere, no land nearby. So we just slept in the boats. Uh, we had used these tires to drive the kayaks across the Altiplano. No flat tires. In Gabon, all flat tires within 24 hours. Uh, so I'm, I, I actually, I'm surprised that we're smiling because it was quite arduous. We had to drag the kayaks when we needed to portage, et cetera. The beauty of Africa and the beauty of the kayaks, obviously, is super quiet and a lot of big animals here, a family of elephants crossing the lagoon. Uh, Europe was a little tricky because felt kind of known, but we went to the islands off of Croatia in the middle of the Aegean Sea or the middle of the Adriatic Sea. And uh, same thing, incredible beauty. Uh, one of the environmental stories, of course, in all these places is the status of the fish population. And in Croatia, they, they're on this beautiful uh, ocean, this beautiful sea. And essentially vacant of fish because it's been completely and largely overfished. These are uh, tanks, underwater nets, where they keep uh, tuna that they capture. And the Japanese uh, boats from Japan come all the way over to, to Croatia to buy the tuna and take it back home because it's such a, a high-priced commodity, commodity in Japan. Uh, Australia was tough because it's so big. And, you know, where do, where do you find one kind of uh, emblematic place that, to represent Australia. You know, I took different teams each time, although I largely traveled with the same photographer and videographer, but often at times then I would find one or two persons, local, local persons to come with us for the knowledge of the place and the history and sometimes the language. Uh, but we ended up in Tasmania, just off the coast of the north, north the southern coast of Australia, uh, which is great. And Contrary to our experience in Croatia, here the fish population is actually pretty good uh, because they'd taken stringent uh, measures to, to limit what, what people could take, etc. cetera. Uh, same thing, surprising beauty all the time. This is at the southern tip of, uh, of Tasmania, rounding the southeastern corner. And then I'd save this trip for the, for the last. This is my return to Antarctica. Uh, you know, we, we had started by dog sled in the 1989 and 90. This was 10 years later in 19, or in 2009, sorry, in 2009. And we sailed down there in a sailboat and then kayaked 600 miles down the coast of the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, I've been to Antarctica many, many times. Uh, it's like another planet. You never, you never get tired of it. Um, I, I, I love Antarctica so much, I, I thought I'd show you a little video clip, so Rallo, maybe now would be the time to, to show the, the glacier, the calving iceberg. And then we spy in the distance a beautiful, rare ice arch carved out of a giant iceberg.
it's almost as if that was uh, cinematically directed for us. We, we weren't even going to pass by that, and we decided we should go take a look, since it's rare to see arches like that. In my experience, I've never seen an arch collapse, ever. Extremely beautiful. There's 11 of us on the boat, lots of Antarctic experience. No one's ever seen an arch collapse like that. The next day, we return to investigate. Overnight, the rest of the arch has fallen into the cold ocean. <laughs> so that was Antarctica. That was the end of that Ocean State project. And I kind of walked away from that uh, a little bit because I didn't want to be known as, as the kayak guy. I've been doing that for a decade or longer. And, you know, my interests are were beyond not beyond just the, the kayaking. So we kept making films all with an environmental story to tell, but we kind of left the kayaks at home. <laughs> made a beautiful film in, in the Galapagos. Uh, we made a really interesting film about uh, the tuna industry uh, based in Japan. This is the big uh, to uh, fish market in Tokyo called Skiji, where these are all frozen tunas, which sell for tens of thousands of dollars. I uh, made a couple films in Louisiana about the risk to the coastline down there and because of uh, oil and gas exploration and spills, et cetera. And then a couple years ago, well, I guess it was a six year long project, but it was based on my having traveled on coastlines around the world. I started to hear about the fact that many, many, many of the men who work on uh, commercial fishing boats in, out of Southeast Asia out of, and Indonesia were, are slaves. Uh, they're often Shanghai or conned into taking jobs and then sometimes they don't get paid for years and cannot leave the boats so we made a really powerful film about the, the based on the stories that we accumulated from these guys who had had been had escaped and then had been helped by this woman patma who's who's made it her mission in life to find and repatriate these guys because often they end up far 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 from home and if they do escape they end up on islands or coastlines where they don't speak the language they have no id papers they have no money um, and she's been scouring the islands, looking for these people, these men, and they are all men, um, and trying to at least give them the option of returning back home if they'd like. But yeah, was, the movie was called Ghost Fleet. We we showed it at the Vatican. We showed it at the United Nations. Uh, we showed it to the board of directors of Walmart uh, because uh, a lot of the fish these guys catch goes into, into pet food, and Walmart sells $10 billion of pet food a year. So we're just encouraging them to take a close look at their supply chain. Um, but, you know, during the, all this time, I, I was traveling a lot. I think one year I was home in the Hudson Valley, just 77 days. But I always, you know, had a house here. This was always my home. And, you know, it didn't take a, a didn't take much to remind me that, uh, you know, you can find great adventure in your own backyard and you can find powerful environmental stories in your own backyard. So I, I made the conscious decision going back to almost 2012 when I was quite uh, involved in the effort in efforts to um, stop or ban fracking in New York state. Uh, I, we turned our cameras towards our, our backyard and have now have made more than 20 films here, uh, short films uh, and short means anywhere from five to five minutes to 30 minutes. Um, and Rallo, maybe that prologue to the Hudson river, maybe that now would be appropriate time to play that. Past couple decades, I'm lucky to have been able to travel around the world, literally continent by continent, often by sea kayak, looking at the health of the planet's coastlines, estuaries, and rivers. This Hudson River Valley has such a rich history, both in terms of its wildlife and its people. You know, going back to the Native Americans who used this same Hudson River as a corridor for transporting pelts and fish to the modern day where there are 20 million people who live near the edges of its shoreline and use the river for commerce as well. Wars have been waged here, pirates once lived at its mouth, and industries have boomed 
and busted up and down the river. Brick making, cement, iron mines, commercial fishing, which has led to incredible riches over the years, but also grave consequences. That industrial revolution had a great impact on the river and its valley's wildlife. It was a pattern of pollution that ravaged the river into the 1960s and 1970s, and in some instances continues today. Today, of course, instead of pelts and fish, the cargo moving up and down the river is largely oil and gas in unprecedented volume by both train and barge. An aging nuclear plant sits just 35 miles from the heart of New York City, awaiting a decision to relicense it or not. And the biggest construction project in North America, the $4 billion rebuilding of the Tappan Zee Bridge, provides jobs but threatens the river's ecosystem. It's clear to anyone who spends time on the Hudson today that it is both an incredibly rich resource, but also still a river at risk. Rondell Creek, which comes out of Kingston. Um, and I, you know, it was easy for me to find the river at risk stories because they were kind of well known, even though each was at a different point of, of development. Um, you know, the river has, in the 1970s, the river was very, very dirty, much different than it is today. You know, they, they built, uh, General Motors built cars down just north of the Tarrytown Bridge. And it was said that you could tell what what color they were using to paint the cars that day, judging by the color of the river. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, then in, in, you know, going back to this 1940s, 1970s, General Electric had big plants uh, north on the Hudson that, that per, you know, knowingly dumped uh, barrel after barrel of PCBs, which is equivalent of, of barrels and barrels of oil into the river. They all settled on the bottom of the river. And as, as, a, as a result, um, uh, the river has, has been highly polluted ever, ever since. Um, but then in the recent years, the traffic of oil and gas uh, moving up and down the river by train, by boat, by pipeline has increased enormously. So uh, again, this finding finding stories to tell about uh, environmental risks was, was, was not hard. These are these uh, oil-filled uh, uh, bomb trains that run up and down the river. And they're called bomb trains because they have a history of running off the rails and exploding, which is obviously decimating to the areas where they come off the rails. And you'll see them, if you travel along the Hudson at all, you'll see them running right along the, the edge of the river. And our concern was always that one of these things was going to go into the river and, and cleaning up oil spills in the, in the Hudson River would have been a, a nightmare. You know, the, the one interesting thing about the Hudson, of course, it's tidal. You know, it's impacted by the Atlantic, the tides of the Atlantic Ocean coming up the estuary. So all the way up to where I am, which is 100 miles north of New York City, uh, that you know, you're impacted by tides four times a day, coming in and out, in and out. Um, and so oil in the river would, wouldn't be like I've witnessed oil spills on the Mississippi River, and as catastrophic as they are, you know, the Mississippi River is big and powerful and just moves everything down river all, and then it's out into the Gulf. Here, that water would that spill would wash around in the Hudson River for for years uh, at, with the tides back and forth like water in a bathtub. Uh, also then there, a couple years ago, there was a, a request by the, by the Coast Guard to allow uh, big tankers to park permanently on the Hudson River. Uh, and they claimed that it was for safety reasons, but the reality was they wanted to park there so they could wait for the ebbs and tides of the oil market. And then they could park, park the boat full of oil uh, that had come from the Midwest somewhere over to the port of Albany and, and wait for the prices to go up and then take them to market, take the oil to market. Uh, and in, in, inevitably, if that had been allowed, it would have resulted in spills and leaks, uh, just inevitable anytime you, you're transporting oil and gas. Um, this is the cleanup of the PCBs up near uh, Troy, New York. Uh, General Electric spent, you know, 70, $80 million fighting against the cleanup. They made the mess, but they didn't want to clean it up. Uh, the EPA finally uh, forced them to clean it up, but by that time their ask was was too small. And when the GE finally pulled out, they'd only cleaned up about a third of the problem. So it's still an issue. 
Uh, then Governor Cuomo had said that uh, he was going to force the EPA to clean it up, and if the EPA wouldn't pay for it, he was going to get the state to pay for it. Now we have a new governor. I don't know what her stance on uh, on cleaning up PCBs is, but it's a it's a, it's a problem that's going to go on for for a hundred years. I went to a meeting of uh, in Poughkeepsie a few years ago where EPA uh, scientists who had just studied the, the Hudson River uh, kind of painfully admitted that it was going to be a century a century before you could safely eat fish from the Hudson River. So that, that pollution is obviously quite damning. Up until a year ago, we had uh, a leaky nuclear power plant on the Hudson called Indian Point. Um, and no matter you know what your stance on, uh, on nuclear or hydrogen uh, energy going forward, this uh, was a, a decrepit old facility that was falling apart and in, in, you know, in, kind of inevitably it was going to leak or have an accident or something. So about a year ago, it the, the, the was shut down, which is interesting now, you know, trying to figure out the, the ramifications of having, the, having it shut down in terms of where else is our energy coming from and, and what, how the river is recovering. Because the, the, when it was operating, the Indian Point would, would suck up a billion to two billion fish a year, you know, larvae. And if now that it's not operating, you know, is that helping the fish make a comeback? We, we, it's too early to tell, apparently. Uh, pipelines are everywhere. Um, and we, you know, we tell lots of stories. Uh, uh, alongside this uh, Hudson River series, I've made a, what I call my Deer series. Uh, dear Governor Cuomo, Dear uh, President Obama, Dear Governor Brown, as in Jerry Brown. And now we're, we're finishing Dear President Biden. Uh, holding these politicians accountable for promises made in regard to the environment and promises in many cases not kept. And pipelines is a huge issue. Um, enhanced, obviously, in, in the last couple of months when uh, it, it appeared that the Biden administration was you know, trying to do its best to uh, focus on renewable energy sources. But now with war in Ukraine, there's big demand for pumping everything we can out of, uh, out of wells and liquefying it. Uh, liquefying the gas so it can be shipped by by giant ship across the ocean uh, to Europe to take some of the pressure off of them having to uh, buy Russian oil. So it's a uh, it's an ongoing debate and, and issue. And and we're, we you know we I, I'm a big believer that media can make a difference. I think our, our small movies do make a difference, but it's a challenge. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Thoughts and Valley, but. You know, the Hudson Valley was home to the very first American art form, the Hudson Valley painters, who came in the in the early 1800s and painted these beautiful bucolic scenes of the Hudson River, and then up, up and really were kind of the first environmentalists in some ways. And then in the 1960s, uh, there were big fights against power plants going in in a couple of places up and down the river. The local fishermen's groups complained that something was polluting the river because their fish populations were dying off. And so, as the introduction said, you know, I, I firmly believe, and as do many, that the Hudson Valley was the birthplace of the American environmental movement. And today, <laughs> I stick with this uh, this statistic, even though I'm making it up. I really believe there are more environmental activists in the Hudson Valley than anywhere else in the country per, per capita. Um, but I took those risk movies around the state, and I showed them a lot. We got a lot of good attention, et cetera. But I got bummed out. I thought, wow, it's just nothing, you know, we live in such a beautiful place, but I'm telling these kind of these horror stories. So we pivoted and started making a series I call Hope on the Hudson, which is uh, more optimistic stories, looking at positive things going on. Um, we started working, you know, on river issues, but also lots of agriculture related issues. This was a, from a film called Seeds of Hope, which looked at uh, cooperation between the Hudson Valley farmers and the Aquasasne, who had been moved to reservations up on the Canadian border. And there, these, this red corn that was a specialty of theirs had, had literally dwindled to a few few ears. So now I think that this project is in the fourth or fifth year and they're growing thousands of pounds of this red corn every year down here in the Hudson Valley. Um, it's at a place called the Hudson Valley Farm Hub, which if you're ever in the uh, in the area, you should check out. I mean, I used to say when I first moved up here that uh, and this is, you know, moved up here 35 years ago. Um, I used to say that every third person you met was a was a masseuse. Now every third person I meet is either a farmer or a brewer or a baker, uh, especially young people, which is great. Uh, we have a, you know, a, a long history of environmental activism on the river. This is the Clearwater, which is the environmental education boat built by Pete Seeger, going back to the 
fifties and sixties. And it takes kids and up and down the river all summer long. Very beautiful. If you've not been on the Clearwater, uh, they're based in Beacon, but they also dock up in Kingston and they do great trips. You can, you can sign on to them anytime. Um, I, I, I've shown these films in and around New York City often, and it's kind of hard sometimes because uh, folks in the city don't really think of uh, the river that much, the Hudson or the East River or the Harlem River or the Atlantic Ocean. That It's right there. But it was clear to me that, that, you know, the, that New York City is a city on the water. Four of the five boroughs are islands. You can't go anywhere without going across a bridge or a tunnel. There's 520 miles of, of coastline in New York City. So we made a really fun film called City on the Water, looking at uh, New Yorkers' relationship with, with, with the Hudson, et cetera. Uh, we made a film called A Living River, which is all about uh, the, the incredible wildlife that is still out there. If we were in person, I'd ask you to guess what that is, but I'll tell you, it's a it's an eight or nine foot long uh, sturgeon. Uh, it's probably 60 or 70 years old, but the day we were out, this is the Department of Environmental Conservation tagging the, the fish. They catch them in big nets and then tag them so they can monitor their health. But there was a, a sturgeon expert on the river that day and using sonar, he was able to see 14 and 15 foot long sturgeon on the bottom of the, of the floor of the, of the Hudson River, uh, which probably weighed about 800 pounds. <laughs> uh, a quarter of which, a quarter to a third of which is caviar. So uh, it's, a, it's a, unfortunately the sturgeon are, are still suffering, but I think the Hudson in, in the United States is, is home to more sturgeon than anywhere. Uh, grains. We've done a couple of big projects on growing grains, and that's important for encouraging all those bakers and brewers and distillers who have moved to the Hudson Valley to open up uh, breweries and and, uh, and and bakeries, et cetera. Uh, so this is a test of plots where they're trying to figure out which, which grains grow best in the Hudson Valley climate. Uh, one of the big issues uh, for the fish life is the fact that there are literally thousands of small abandoned dams on the tributaries that lead into the Hudson, meaning that the fish can't or find it difficult. It looks beautiful. It looks like, a, you know, actually a kind of a real estate come on, you know, have, have your own waterfall. But unfortunately, it impedes the ecosystem by disallowing fish, which used to spawn by going up, up creeks. Now they can't get up creek because of these all these abandoned dams. Um, so we've done a couple of films on that. And then again, you know, we're, I, I take great luxury in the fact that this, on many days, this kind of scene is my office. You know, we, we end up spending a lot of time either on the river or in the middle of these beautiful farm fields. And I, I feel really privileged to have that as my as my backyard. Um, and we made a very fun film called Farmscape Ecology, which asks the question of can wildlife and, and agriculture coexist? Um, so each of these films, you know, has kind of a polemic attached uh not a lot of not always a lot of answers because we're dealing with scientists who have you know take years and years to to work on these issues um but i think we've done a pretty good job of illustrating and educating uh for folks uh, how the hudson has changed and how it's gotten better and at the same time still suffers you know i i, I drive across the, one of the bridges that crosses the hudson almost on a daily basis between Columbia County and Ulster County. And I, every day I'm blown away by the beauty because uh, no matter the time of day, no matter with stormy or bright blue sky or foggy, I mean, it's just stunningly beautiful. But then I take a deep breath and I'm reminded of the environmental ills that are still problematic on the river, including PCBs, including uh, the fact that you, the commercial fishing is disallowed because of that pollution, et cetera. So there's still challenges, but uh, we're doing our part to kind of bring these stories back to people and uh, hopefully making a difference. And I think that's it. Amazing. Thank you, John, so much for uh, walking us through those uh, beautiful imagery and the stories that you have to tell. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions for you lined up that I'm excited to, to, to dig into. Uh, meanwhile, for our audience members, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them now and we will, Try to get to those as well. Mm. Um, so, so John, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, what has it meant to you personally to create films around the environment? What drives you and inspires and keeps you motivated, given all the challenges you probably face? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because you know I have this pre-film history of writing for magazines and books, etc., and 
you know, sadly, I, I, I have a couple few too many stories of, you know, sitting in a Barnes and Noble waiting to sign books for people who are coming to buy, buy books and, you know, and having a few people show up. I mean, it was, it's really hard for a writer to, to get an echo from, from their audience. Whereas with the films, you know, we take them in and we'll get, you know, a hundred people, a couple hundred people, and you get instant feedback. You get an instant echo from people, which I really like. And, and create, you know, as a creator, I, I, I kind of need that. I need that, that little feedback. Um, so I, I'm really happy to have morphed into uh, to making the films. Uh, sometimes though, you know, and, and another of the advantages is, is writing is very solo occupation. You spend a lot of time on your own and filmmaking is a very collaborative process. So, uh, mm-hmm. I I like that collaborative part as well. Yeah, it makes sense Uh, from a creative perspective. I I get, I've done a lot of stand-up comedies. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it's, it's, it's nice to have that audience feedback versus, you know, during the pandemic, we switched to, you know, the online medium, which is harder to get that feedback. You don't know. Who was was your audience for stand-up during the pandemic? Nobody. Nobody. (laughs) That's no problem. (laughs) I mean, I'm sure there's some some people there, but it's hard to get the feedback. So it definitely makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, wanting to get that feedback from the audience through your films. Um, so you, you've created so many films sponsored by National Geographic. How did you become affiliated with National Geographic? Well, it goes back to that Antarctica uh, dog sledding expedition. That they, I, it was 1988. I was living in Brooklyn. I, they were going to, they were considering me as the, as the writer for the story. And so I had to take, I took a train. I had, I bought a tie at, uh, at Grand Central, because I don't think I owned a tie at the time, and went down and met with, you know, uh, five or six long-time National Geographic editors, which in those days were all white men of a certain age with their button-down shirts and their sleeves rolled up, you know, who interviewed me to see if I was up to the task, because I was kind of young for to be a National Geographic person at that age. Uh, I mean, I was in my mid-30s, but they used to, you know, like older persons to do their traveling. <laughs> Um, so anyway, they approved, and uh, I wrote the story. And then I learned a lot. I learned so much from that Antarctica expedition about uh, fundraising, about dealing with media, about you know organizing a team, etc. Et that I then really just started organizing my own uh, expeditions, which then National Geographic, in a, in a very timely happenstance, created this expeditions council, which funded uh, people like like me. And I benefited from the fact that. Uh, uh, I was doing sea kayak expeditions. There was no competition. Hmm. There weren't like a lot of other persons applying for grant monies and things to do that. Whereas in a lot of the climbing trips, you know, they'd get applications from 20 or 30 climbing groups every year. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the fact that I could write actually helped because then they knew they were going to get uh, content and stories out of our, our, the things they funded and and with me they got really good value for their investment because i i could i could write for all those different mediums we but you know we in that then when we when i went to the Aleutian islands with kayaks it was the very beginning of technology i mean i uh, if i look back at how things changed between 1999 and 2009 in regard to technology 1999 i had a set phone very early sat phone, but I, had, I couldn't I couldn't do anything with it. I, I, I could call, but I couldn't send text. Or So we couldn't send photos. We couldn't send video. We couldn't send text. I would write the dispatches down on paper and then call them in to somebody, some assistant's desk in, in D.C., and he or she would have to transcribe that and turn it into a dispatch. That, that was it. That was 1999. Mm-hmm. By 2009, we sailed down to Antarctica, and I had a little uh, began satellite system about the size of a laptop, and we could sell, send text and photos and video from south of the Antarctic Circle, which no one ever really thought we could do. So that alone was incredible. And then on the photography side, I mean, just that simple introduction of drones. I mean, think how, how prevalent drones, drone footage is now. And we had none of that for the entirety of that project. In 2009, when we were sailing down to Antarctica, drones were just coming into the main, just being introduced. But we didn't feel we had the skills to not lose them, so we opted not to take them. But since then, that, that's been a huge revolution in, in how stories are told. I want to really quickly grab this audience question from Lauren. Uh, what's a place you've never explored that you'd love to go to? What would you want to do there? Hmm. 
Well, it's kind of unrelated to water, actually. But, you know, oftentimes when I would go to National Geographic headquarters in, in, in D.C., a lot of the editors would have giant wall maps uh, on, their, on their walls there. And I always would look at the, the stands, Afghanistan, Pakistan, on and on. <laughs> And think uh, we should find trips to do there because it's an incredible culture and, and history that is unfortunately is, is, has, has, long, has seemed off limits uh, to even the kind of adventures we have. Um, that when you when you when we would go out and do these National Geographic adventures, they would send you out with a with what they called a dazzler, which is a fancy letter, you know, dear Mac, dear sir, madam, please uh, I'll recognize and, and accept the presence of our esteemed colleague, et cetera, and have fancy labels on it and ribbons and things. And and some in some countries that worked. In some kind of people were very impressed and they want a copy of it. Some pre, some places they could care less. But even with that good housekeeping seal of approval, which is the National Geographic brand, uh, it was it's hard sometimes to, to travel in in parts of the world like the stands. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that that's one. But you know, there are how many countries are, and territories are there? Countries, there's 195 or so, and I've been to probably I've been to like 95. So, mm -hmm. I'm, but I'm pretty well traveled, but I've only been to half the countries. You know, so there's a lot out there still to explore. Yeah, actually, um, there's another audience question here to piggyback on that, um, and it's it's something that I think all of us face when we try to make our decisions about travel. Um, uh, myself included. So the question is from, from Caitlin, how do you balance your sense of adventure with the negative impacts traveling can have on the environment and climate change? I myself just came back from a beautiful trip to Ireland um, and purchased some carbon offsets actually for, for the first time. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's a question all of us ha have to face at some time, you know, or another, you know, how do we balance that desire and need to travel with the, with the impacts that it can have on the on the environment? Well, I benefit in that. I mean, I, I, I certainly agree. Uh, we're making this Dear President Biden film right now, and uh, it was the first time I'd crossed state lines in more than two years. We went to mm -hmm. Jersey and Philadelphia and, and D.C. and Virginia, and Louisiana, Texas, Iowa. So it did involve some plane trips, which but I hadn't flown for a couple of years. But in the course of that reporting, there was a great climate scientist. Actually, he's gotten a bunch of viral uh, attention in the last week or so. He uh, works for NASA, but he lives in Los Angeles. His name is Peter Kalmus. And he has, since 2010, refused to fly uh, mm -hmm. just for that because, because the missions created by flying are such a big contributor to, to global warming. Um, so we sent a, I interviewed him by Zoom, and we uh, sent a camera operator from L.A., live nearby to go over and shoot him. So we are making those kind of decisions. And to be honest, I, you know, since 1990, or I'm sorry, since 2015, we've been working on this, working on this Hudson River series, which has kept me home a lot, you know, where I can sleep in my own bed and we, we drive to places we don't, we don't fly. So I, I, I'm certainly yeah. of that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, uh, focus on our local community sometimes is so often overlooked. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've been doing that. In fact, um, you know, you're talking about it. You're, one of your major film projects being the Hudson River Stories Project really explores climate change and other environmental challenges for the Hudson River Valley. Um, but So why should we care about the Hudson River? I know you touched on that a little bit in your um, beautiful footage, but what influenced you to document the area? Um, what keeps you what really keeps you up at night about it? Well, the, the the film that we're working on locally here is uh, all about the impacts of sea level rise on the Hudson, including in New York City, um, and how you know, we, we interviewed a great scientist from Columbia University who who said, you know, the communities that are are dealing with or planning for climate change, in, the impacts of climate change and rising sea levels, the communities that are dealing with that now, they might be okay, but the communities that aren't dealing with it. Are, are going to be in trouble. So, and it, you know, I think in, over the course of the summer, you're going to see a new plan from the Army Corps of Engineers about how best to protect New York City, uh, Brooklyn, southern tip of Manhattan, uh, Queens, Staten Island, uh, the, you know, Jamaica Bay, et cetera. You know, there had been a proposal a few years ago to build giant gates, and, and which was mm -hmm. shut down, weirdly shut down by, by then-President Trump uh, because he thought it was a waste of money. 
he didn't really care about the environmental impacts. He just thought it, and he, he said, "Well, just tell them to tell tell the citizens to buy uh, buy new mops and pails." That was his uh, his thoughts on, on how best to deal with climate change. Um, you know, but interestingly, uh, that film about the, the impacts of rising sea levels on the Hudson River is going to have international ramifications because what's happening on our coastline and our shores is happening around the world. Everyone who lives on a, on a coast or a shoreline is going to be impacted by this and not in the far distance. I mean, now, I mean, it was, it was just, I think a week ago that we had massive uh, uh, snow and then ice and rain here. And I went down to the Hudson River and the Rondau Creek and a couple others that of the tributaries that flow into the Hudson. And they were just way out of their banks, way out of their banks. Um, you know, we have another issue, and this is related to some of the uh, federal uh, legislation going on in, in D.C. Um, our infrastructure is is crumbling, and uh, 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 in regard to most waterways, including the Hudson River, the big problem is that the sewage systems can't keep up when it rains heavily. Right. So that's a huge issue on the Hudson River. I mean, people say, can you swim in the Hudson? I, I, I and, and the, really the smartest environmentalists, environmentalists working here all have the same message, which is if it's rained in the last couple of days, yeah, skip it. <laughs> but if it's dry, if it's been dry, it's okay. Because every time it rains, the sewage system overflows. And that's from, you know, Albany to New York City. That's yeah. a lot of, a lot of dirty water. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I lived through Sandy um, down at the time I lived down Wall Street and remember the streets flooding. Um, it was unbelievable. And it seems like it's only a matter of time before. Well, we have another quote from a scientist. You remember during Sandy when you, there, there were those images of, of the subway entrances just being flooded with, you know, yeah, I saw them firsthand. It was yeah. unbelievable. Well, this scientist said, you know, in the not so distant future, that's going to happen every day because yeah. of the foundation of sea level rise and, 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 and climate change. Um, you know, in, uh, this is maybe 50 years from now or 75 years. We, we don't know exactly. Um, yeah. so, and, and what can we do? That's, you know, it's a <laughs> sizable, sizable question. So um, in your film, A Living River, you mentioned that Shad, the uh, poor man's salmon, as it's referred to, uh, may be making a comeback. So maybe there's a little bit of hope there. But this is a fish that was you know, once very prolific in the area, but has been uh, apparently mostly absent since about 2010. What happened to Shad and, and what does it mean? What does its return mean for the Hudson River and for New Yorkers? Yeah, I, you know, I do a weekly radio show, The Green Radio Hour, which uh, runs on uh, commercial radio and then uh, as a podcast I had just last week a, a marine biologist from the Department of Environmental Conservation on the radio show to talk about efforts that they're making to re reintroduce uh, shad and other, and other endemic fish. Um, one of the problems is, is overfishing and part of it's on the on the Hudson River overfishing but a lot of it is these fish migrate. You know they, they don't live in the Hudson River year-round. They the, Some of them go as the eels that you see in the little creeks up here come from the Sargasso Sea which is a thousand miles away, come up to the Hudson and spawn in the Hudson and, and then return home and die. So uh, it, 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 it's home to all sorts of fascinating wildlife, but we've, we've made it more difficult for them. But a lot of those shad and, and others get caught in the Atlantic Ocean. You know, it's not that we're overfishing on the Hudson per se, although we have in the past, but today it's really hard to reintroduce them because they're getting hammered by big commercial fishing boats in the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, so actually just zooming out for a minute, um, you know, based on what you learned through your filmmaking and your deep environmental community involvement, and I know you kind of touched on this in one of your films, but you know, can farming and wildlife coexist? Um, what, you know, what would that have to look like to, you know, be in a truly sustainable environment? Yeah, well, it's tricky. Um, and, and yeah, we made a, a film specifically called Farmscape Ecology, which is based on conversations with scientists and the experimental work of scientists working on soil health, water quality, uh, insect and, and bugs, because they, they're very, uh, they, they signify the health of, of local farm fields. Um, and yes, the, absolutely, they can uh, work together. But, you know, we, we do our filming at a 1700-acre at a organic farm. 
and not everyone is operating organic organically in, in the country or, or in the Hudson Valley. So it's, you know, you on your plot, even if you're farming 10 acres or 100 acres or 1,700 acres or more, you may be following organic practices. But if your neighbor is using pesticides still and, and that runoff is going into the creek that runs through your property, you know, it, it's so it's kind of not until we're all on the same page that 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 that, that kind of study of can wildlife and nature and, and farming coexist. Well, what's it going to take for us to get on the same page? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, the, the other issue, and so I, I did a conversation yesterday with the heads of all the environmental groups up here uh, on an Earth Day, pre-Earth Day event, and uh, someone was reminding that at, at home, uh, you know, don't fertilize more than may, if you have to fertilize, maybe do it once a year or twice a year. Some people are fertilizing their, their lawns, you know, every week or every month or something, and all that fertilizer ultimately ends up in our waterways and the nitrates in, in, the, in the waterways are, are is extremely harmful for the for the fishes. So, uh, you know, it it, 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 it it sometimes it's kind of tricky knowing too much. You know, having mm -hmm. pulled back the curtain and, and looked behind because you know you see kind of the the inner workings, the sausage making of, of uh, environmental ills. And um, but and the the reason I'm optimistic, or the reason I have any optimism, is because of the people that we meet. You know, I I, I take great pride in having met what I call a lot of accidental environmentalists, people who didn't, you know, met no matter their walk of life, whether they're, a, a, you know, one of the women I most admire here was, a, was a, uh, a cancer biologist. And she just found out that a pipeline was coming through her backyard. And now she's the leading kind of expert on this pipeline. It was not her intention. She stumbled into it. And we meet those people here in the Hudson Valley. We meet these people across the country whose lives have been turned and, and become these full-blown committed environmental activists, even though that was not their intention. Um, but the fact that people are willing to try and, and do that and spend, as we know, so much time uh, to, on those on those backyard issues, it's always, always impresses me. Well, so, you know, what's, you know, for those of us, especially in the New York area, uh, what is the one thing we could all do to better engage and protect the Hudson River and the Hudson Valley? Yeah, uh, go down to, you know, no matter where you live, find somewhere where you can get close to the river, and, you know, on a regular basis, just go look at it, you know, drink it in uh, on a, you know, beautiful spring day, go sit in the sun, you know, just remind yourself that, it, that it's there. Because that, that's kind of the, the big disconnect for, for big city livers is you, you don't have any connection with it. And oftentimes people who live in the heart of the city may never see the river. But as I suggested, you know, it, New York City, when we think of cities that are on the water, we think of you know, Miami and Seattle and, and then all sorts of places around the, the world. But New York City is similarly a city on the water. Um, but I think it helps to, I think you're, you're more committed to it if you if you have an experience with it or you see it at least. Yeah. Um, okay, so you have a new film coming out, Dear President Biden. Uh, what's the message about the environment for President Biden that we should all get behind? Uh, well, you know, he came into office and he, and he campaigned saying that he was going to make climate change uh, a priority number one. Mm -hmm. And when he first came into office, the first week he did a couple of really great things. He, he, he stopped uh, the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, he pulled back on federal on drilling on federal lands, et cetera. But now, you know, politics have changed. People are less concerned about, they seem to be more concerned about, you know, rising gas prices and et cetera. And then, you know, while we were out traveling across the country asking people to, to, to ask President Biden to leave fossil fuels in the ground, as we were out reporting that, you know, the war in Ukraine broke out and now there's global demand for drilling more and sending more. And, and the problem with that is that, you know, right now Europe has no infrastructure for distributing the oil and gas that we might send them. So it's going to take years, you know, to, to, to build that. And that means that our focus on climate change is going to be stalled by a generation and we don't have a generation. You know, we all kind of, intellectually, we all understand that, but it's, it's a hard reality that if we don't move on this stuff now, uh, it's going to be too late. Yeah. Um, J John, what do you want your legacy to look like? Yeah. I saw that on your list of questions. <laughs> uh, I, I almost wanted to, to prompt you that I, I don't really want to think about my legacy because that suggests mm -hmm. that I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we've all got something that we're working towards. You know, I, I yeah. just really think about mine. 
Um, you know, you've, you've worked on so many beautiful films and projects, you know, what, what is your ultimate goal here? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm sometimes creators are most proud of one thing they've, they've made, whether it's a, a book or a film or, uh, I, I really like the broad span of, of things that I've created. I, in the, my early 20s, I ran a weekly newspaper, and I, I have bound copies of that, and I go back and look at it, and I'm always very happy, happily impressed by how many environmental stories are in those early papers. So I've been telling these environmental stories for 40-odd years, um, and, I, and I, I think so. I, I, if anyone were to step back and look at my ouvoir, I, I think they'd be happy to see that it would encompass magazines and newspapers and books and films and conversations like this all kind of pointed in the same direction. So uh, one last question for you, John, what three books or films do you recommend for our oh, viewers? What three books? Uh, well, because of the Dear President Biden thing, I've been reading a book called uh, uh, Overheated by, by uh, Kate Aronoff. Overheated, it's all about politics and, and capitalism and, and our energy system. George Packer, Who's a who's a who's a writer for the New Yorker? Um, uh, he's written a book of essays called "The Last Best Hope" and kind of looks at at the future of of, of America. And then I'm a sucker for uh, Jack Reacher, and so it feels like I read a new Lee Child book every every month. But I'm sure it's not quite that. Uh, so, uh, John Bowermaster, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, and I'm. Hope, hope to see this widely shared. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yep.